the uh, uh, website later. Um, all right, so kia ora koutou. Uh, welcome to the, the first um, seminar for the Otago Energy Research Center seminar series for, for 2022. Um, thanks for, for coming along. Um, I think we've got a really um, interesting range of presentations. And the idea here was just to give um, those people that were received the Otago Energy Research Center summer scholarships an opportunity to share um, some of the things they, they did. So um, these will be a bit uh, rapid fire uh, kind of present presentations. There will be some time for, for questions. Uh, but really, if you want uh, more details, it's uh, this seminar is designed to introduce you to people that you can follow up with uh, with afterwards. Um, so these uh, scholarships were co-funded by OERC and the host of the various host departments. Um, and what we'll do is each uh, each student will have four to five minutes to present what they did as part of their summer scholarship. And then we'll save um, uh, two minutes or so for questions, and then we'll we'll just move on to the next one. And we should have uh, a bit of time at the end if anyone wants to to follow up on any of those things. Um, so I guess we'll we'll move on, and uh, I'll introduce Rena Watt. Uh, Rena did her her project uh, based in. Departments of Math and Mathematics and Statistics and in Physics. Uh, she'll uh, present based on exploring ocean wave renewable energy potential around New Zealand. Uh, Rena, do you want to uh, share your screen and take it away? Yeah, uh, just checking that you guys can hear me. Yep, good. Uh, cool. And then I'll just share my screen. Cool. Has that PowerPoint come up now? Still loading. Oh, there it is. Yeah. That one? Yeah. Cool. All good. Okay. Um, bear with me because I've just recovered from COVID. So I hope my voice cooperates. Um, so yeah, I'm Rena Watt and I'm one of the energy management students here at Otago. Um, and just starting my honors year. So I was co-supervised by Fabian Montiel and Michael Jack um, over the summer to work on this project. Um, so just to get started, a brief background. As a keen surfer and someone who really cares for the environment, particularly the ocean, I figured it would be a valuable topic to explore this abundant resource we are surrounded by. And like any surfer, have a quick excuse to check the surf forecast regularly. But what I want to say is, um, I think it's important to consider how geographically unique we are. If we look at this picture here, New Zealand's surrounded by 15,000 kilometres of coastline and we're situated near these like unimpeded um, waves where we can get these large and frequent swell events, particularly on the West Coast. Um, so our current renewable share is roughly 81%, and that's mainly hydro, geothermal, wind, and solar. Wave power is yet to be commercialized. But if we think about the recent net carbon zero by 2050 um, amendment act, uh, we're expected to see an increase in electricity demand by 68% um, in this decarbonisation process. So we're going to have quite a significant transition to renewable energy and hence why I considered looking at some kind of unused resource. So the last known study on wave energy was um, take, uh, recognized study, sorry, was done by uh, Neewood Energy Scape, which was published over 12 years ago. And their estimates found about 97 gigawatts um, available for all of New Zealand. Um, so just to build on their research, um, we got in touch with Met Ocean Solutions, who provided us with 40 years worth of wave data for the entirety of New Zealand. So working in MATLAB, we were able to calculate wave power for all of New Zealand over one year to produce this annual heat map just here on the left. Um, I would have loved to do more, but the computer had a bit of a fit with the size of these files. So that's more for the honors project. So as we can see, wave power is um, directly proportional to the wave height squared.
squared, as we see in this formula used. Uh, it, this computes it in watts per unit meter. And I kind of scaled this to what uh, megawatts per kilometer, just so we can see the scale on this heat map. Um, so seeing as the southwest coast is more energetic, um, I kind of just took a value of two, that 200 megawatts roughly from where the cross is just down there. And um, assuming we can extract a kilometer of wave energy, I chucked this on beside some wave energy annual wave, uh, sorry, annual electricity generation statistics as seen on the right. And just looking here, presumably a small wave farm, not sure if that, so, uh, presumably a small wave farm could have the potential to maybe even overpower a wee coal farm as we can see here. So um, just to wrap up, a few people have commented, there's a reason wave energy hasn't been established yet. Um, it's only commercial in a few countries. We've got the issue of variability and is it actually available? But most importantly, is it accessible? Because it's not obviously on the mainland. So while the Southwest coast has a lot of potential, as we can see here, it is one of the least populated areas of New Zealand. So um, future research, I guess, is to get a bit more depth on seasonal and spatial patterns in New Zealand, but also um, find an optimal location based on population centers, electrical demand patterns, and maybe perhaps if we can fix the mismatch between um, generation and demand. And yeah, thank you for listening. Great, thanks very much, Rena. That was really interesting. Um, hope you had an enjoyable stuff, summer looking at that uh, on yeah. the waves. Uh, <laughs> any uh, questions or comments for, for Rena? You just want to unmute yourself and go ahead. Well, people are still thinking, uh, um, just based on that last point, and maybe it is sort of future research, but do you have any sense around the seasonality of waves relative to peak energy demands and that kind of thing? Um, there has been some look at, like, I think winter, there is actually a lot more power coming through, which is great news from an energy management perspective, is that's when we're really using our energy the most in New Zealand. And, you know, like, unlike solar power, maybe waves is something we can keep extracting overnight as well. So um, yeah, just those two. There's nothing confirmed, but word of mouth and a bit of just literature reading has um, suggested winter might have a bit more grunt. Other questions for Rena? Not, not a question. I just wanted to say that was a really nice talk and, and really nicely presented. Oh, thank you so much. I'm relieved. I thought I was telling it quite fast because I was looking at the time. <laughs> um, yeah. could, is there any, did you get much of a connection to the uh, tidal stream energies in the same way or not? You know, is it So I think you muted yourself for that very last bit. I did, yeah. Would you would you follow up with tidal stream rather than wave in future? Um, yeah, so originally my project was gonna look at both. I think it was still written like that on um, maybe my OERC funding contract, but uh, just the scale of this project just grew the more and more I found out and I never ended up um, having as much time to look at Tidal. And a previous honours student did do it, which is why I thought, okay, I'm going to do something different then. <laughs> but there's definitely potential there. Uh, they talked about the Cook Strait and things, and, you know, um, that's quite, like, there's a lot of potential coming through there, and it's right next to some the capital of New Zealand, so win-win. Great. Well, thanks very much, Rena. Um, we'll move along. Uh, next up, we've got uh, Danielle Lomas, who is um, 
hosted by the School of Geography. Uh, she looked at socializing energy transition models. Over to you, Danielle. Okay, great. <laughs> Okay, can you see that okay? Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so uh, kia ora koutou, I'm Danielle, um, and what I was looking at was how we are modelling the energy transition. Um, so when we talk about energy models, we're normally talking about techno-economic cost optimising models, which focus really heavily on the economy and the technical aspects of it. And it produces graphs like you see on the screen. The details aren't important there, but basically it produces working papers that have the headline of things like going big and fast on renewables could save us trillions. Those are the conclusions that you can come to when you're just plugging in the numbers, um, which is great, it would be fantastic, but you have to ask the question, does, does cost optimization actually really equate to real world transition? Like what about politics and people and society and behavior? And, and what about our concerns for equity and in, environmental concerns? Like, how do we how do we get all of that complexity and all of that messiness into an energy model? So, like, how do we socialize an energy model, basically? So that was what that was my question. Um, and so, what I I did a literature uh, review and then I did some interviews to ask some people how how they're managing it. Um, and what I really found out was that this is actually quite a uh, hot topic among researchers. Um, energy modelers do recognise this challenge and like they want their models to be useful. They want their models to really represent the real world so that they do are useful uh, to decision makers. Um, so what I found is basically uh, we've got three ways that we can socialize an, uh, an energy model. Uh, the first way is just through a process of model enrichment. So this just means making your model uh, more sophisticated by adding proxies and constraints to represent social factors. And even just looking for sources of social and behavioral data, we do have quite a lot of studies out there uh, on society's use of energy. So a lot of modelers just feed that data into their models. Um, and then the second way is through the use of scenarios and storylines. Um, scenarios can be very simple, but um, other modelers spend a long time sitting down with groups of stakeholders and the public uh, to really get a sense of how the transition may play out and what's important. And they really sort of develop a narrative around the transition and that becomes the basis for the model. And then the third way is a bit more experimental. Um, this is uh, what has been called a bridging or a dialogue study where you have your group of social scientists who do the full socio-technical technical analysis of where society's at and how the tech's developing and what's happening with politics. And they make their sort of assessment of how the transition works. And then the modeling team do their run. And then there's just a back and forth, an iterative process between the two teams where they try and work out, they challenge each other on what they've come up with and try between them to come up with a, uh, a pathway that is uh, satisfies the modelers and satisfies the social scientists. Um, and, and by doing that, you can really identify sort of the bottlenecks and the challenges and what sort of policy changes might be needed. Um, so, uh, so how does this kind of translate into um, actual steps? Like as for me, like as a social scientist, like how can social scientists get involved with energy models to, to try and make them uh, to have that sort of social data in there? Um, and there is a number of ways. It just depends on how complicated you want to get, really. I mean, the first thing is because there is huge amounts of social data uh, and studies out there on how we use energy, um, we just want to get more of that data, uh, that are good sources of data before modelers. Um, and, and because modelers are always using scenarios and they're always making assumptions, it's always going to be healthy to have more people uh, involved in writing those scenarios and bringing more perspectives um, into that. Um, and there is scope for collaboration between modelers and social scientists. Uh, if we get more people bringing their cultural and social insights to thinking about the transition, you know, we can just get more pathways thought about and more and have sort of the implications of all the different pathways thought about. Um, and it's so and, and then like the, the model just becomes one component of a bigger dialogue around the transition. And then finally, if we want to get really, really sophisticated on it, it, it has been suggested that the entire conceptual base of models really needs to change. That just cost, cost optimization just is not up for it. We, we really need to think about the normative assumptions around energy justice and environmental protection and design models from that basis. So just conceptually a different model. So there's a challenge on how we might do that. 
And then finally, uh, the big one is if we actually want to bring our transition in line with what's required globally, we have to start thinking about energy descent. So how we might move to model a pathway of energy descent and living well with less is sort of the big challenge and something that you know, would be great if someone would like to pick up at some point. Thank you, that's me. Great, thank you, Danielle. Uh, questions for Danielle? Yeah, just a comment from me, uh, Eric Pyle from Solar Zero. Um, fascinating presentation, thank you. Um, one of the things I think that, uh, and it's just a comment to the group really, that the narrative in the country I think is really important and I think we saw a change um, uh, from previous government to this government in terms of um, climate change being important. Um, you've seen an industry that was strongly opposed to solar um, actually starting to say that solar's all right. I don't know if Janet Stevenson's on the call, but um, uh, the concept reports come to mind from 2015, where I think the, the headline was solar is a great uh, technology, but not for New Zealand. And so the, I think you're absolutely right. The whole narrative is just so important um, in terms of actually the uptake of these different types of energy. And um, I see Ian on the call for X wind industry. I mean, I remember one of the comments uh, when I uh, took over from Ian um, in the wind, uh, wind Association, people said to me, oh, New Zealand's too windy. It's, it's not good for turbines, it's just too windy. And and that, that was part of the narrative as well. So narrative, 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 really important. Thank you for raising it. Yeah, completely agree. Yeah, and the more people there are involved in that process uh, from all sorts of perspectives just makes that, that narrative richer. Yeah. And Danielle, um, do you follow the IEA's uh, user TCP uh, group uh, internationally? Um, um, I'm aware that it exists. Um, uh, one of the people that I interviewed for this uh, referred to that, so I'm aware of it, but I haven't really been following it. Yeah, there's been some absolutely fascinating uh, social behavioural issues um, with Australians taking a very strong lead, but C. Rotman from uh, Wellington has been leading uh, in low-income housing type issues as well. Uh, user C TCP will find it in, on any search. Mm, thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Danielle. Uh, we'll move yeah. along. Um, Yasmin Howell is, uh, is up next um, and hosted in the physics department uh, and looking at the wedding behavior of bubbles. Hi, yeah. Um, sorry, just share my screen. Um, can you see that all right? Yeah, cool. So hi, my name is Yasmin Howell and I've, been, I've just finished a summer studentship looking into the wedding behavior of bubbles. Um, so one goal of this project was to look into using bubbles to scale up the development of surfaces that control the movement of micro droplets. So the collection of micro droplets on heat exchangers and wind turbines cause frost and ice and adding micro or nanostructures to the surfaces of them can make them more repellent. And so that stops the droplets from collecting on them and freezing. Um, so research into developing the surfaces can be expensive and difficult because the research must be done in like a micro scale with uh, micro and nano engineered surfaces, they're quite small. Um, and they can't be scaled up with droplets because the behavior of the droplets change when the diameter is greater than their capillary length, which for water is 2.7 millimeters. So everything must be done on such a small scale. Um, but with soap bubbles, the change in behavior doesn't, doesn't occur until the bubbles are about six meters in diameter. So we could use bubbles potentially to scale up the research so that it's easier and cheaper to, to, to develop surfaces. Um, a better understanding of bubble behavior could also aid in stopping damage from cavitation um, and also to help us to detach bubbles that collect on electrodes during electrolysis reactions. So the bubbles that collect um, on the electrodes reduce the surface area that the reaction can take place on, and this makes the reaction less efficient. And electrolysis reactions are used in electrochemical reactors, and so this would help improve the efficiency of the reactors. Um, so now just on to some background for uh, wetting. Um, so when we talk about wetting behavior, we're talking about the behavior of a liquid which is in contact with a solid surface. So a good way to measure this is through contact angles, and the larger the contact angle, the more repellent the surface is going to be to the liquid. So one type of contact angle is the static contact angle. Um, 
and in droplets. So this is uh, the angle that the edge of the droplet makes with the surface when it's stationary. Um, but there's also dynamic contact angles, which relate to droplets when they're in motion. Uh, so there are two main contact angles. So the, you've got the advancing angle, which you can see on the left, and the receding angle, which is on the right. And the advancing angle will always be bigger than the receding angle. And the static contact angle is always just going to be in between the two of them. Um, but when you transition into bubbles, the static contact angle is a little bit different. There's a little bit more going on. Um, because bubbles are made up of a film, there are multiple contact angles that we could look at. So we're just going to focus on this side of the image. Uh, we've got two uh, contact angles, one on the outside of the film and the one on the inside of the film. So for bubbles, we're going to be looking at the one on the inside here. Um, so for the surface, to look at the wetting behavior, we made some surfaces. Um, they're all made of PDMS, which is really good at picking up like really small details and molds. So we can use it for both micro and macro structures on a surface. Um, so when it's first mixed together, it's a liquid, a liquid which then sets into a solid. So we 3D printed some molds, which is made of PLA. Um, and we didn't just 3D print the surfaces uh, with the PLA because it's less repellent than um, PDMS. And we wanted the surfaces to be as repellent as possible. Um, so these surfaces had two different types of topography. Uh, we had lined surfaces and pillared surfaces. And we also wanted to test the effect of area fraction um, on the contact angle of the bubbles. Uh, which is a measure of how solid the surface is. Um, and it tells us what fraction of the surface is solid. So for example, an area fraction of 0 0.25 correlates with a surface structure making up 25% of the area and the other 75% being made of air. So for this project, we had surfaces with four different area fractions, as well as like a flat control surface with an area fraction of one. And this just gives you a better view of the lines and the pillars that I was talking about before. So ideally, we would have taken static contact angle measurements for this project, but the bubbles needed to be detached from the bubble dispenser. And this added too many variables to get consistent results within the time constraint. So instead, we did some dynamic contact angle measurements um, because we know the static contact angle is going to sit somewhere between the two of them. Um, so the bubble dispensing was videoed. And you can see that here. And the measurements were taken from the videos. So the advancing angle is taken when the bubble's at its greatest, and the receding angle is taken the frame before the bubble detaches from the surface. Um, and as far as we're aware, this is the first time any contact angle measurements of a bubble on a structured surface have been taken, as well as any dynamic contact angle measurements for bubbles have been measured. Um, so these are just some of the results we got. Um, so for both types of surfaces, the contact angle decreased as the area fraction increased. Um, which, so it suggests that to make the most repellent surface, we want to be up in here, uh, decreasing the area fraction as much as possible. Um, so this trend mimics that of a droplet, which is in the Cassie Baxter state, where the area fraction is increasing and the contact angle is decreasing. Um, so that's when the droplet sitting on top of the structure, as opposed to the Wingle state where it sinks into the structure. Um, so this is a photo from one of our tests, and you can see that the bubble is sitting in that Cassie Baxter state on top of the structures. So for future work, uh, we'd want to invert the setup because we have these droplets forming on the bottom of the bubbles when they're dispensing, and this is going to affect the contact angle. So that's just something we want to improve. Uh, we'd also like to vary the like structures on top of the the macro structures and on the sides. So the micro, or we could have micro or nano structures on the sides of each of those. Um, and then there's been a recent phenomena, uh, which is coalesced induced jumping, which is found in micro droplets. So when two micro droplets combine in the right way, they can jump off of the surface for a moment. Um, so if we could achieve this with bubbles, it could potentially be used to rapidly detach bubbles from electrodes uh, in electrochemical reactors, which could make them more efficient. And yeah, thanks. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Yasmin. Uh, any questions for Yasmin? Um, I, this is far from, from my area, but I'm, I'm wondering uh, the different materials, are there implications in terms of accessibility, or is this just a matter of you can print whatever you want and use that as a film on in its in the application of this research? Sorry, could you repeat that? I didn't quite understand. Uh, so the 
the different um, surfaces that you're playing around with? Uh, yeah. Is this just a matter of we can print whatever um, uh, type of surface we want and just uh, um, apply it as a film to uh, a wind turbine or, or whatever? Or are there limitations there? Um, so I'm not 100% sure on the implementation right now, but right now we're just using um, 3D printers so we can make whatever sort of surface we can make. Anything that we're able to 3D print, we can turn into a surface. Um, and then scaling it down would be something we'd look into um, in the future, but yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, we'll move, thank you, Yasmin. Um, we'll move on to William Hadley. Uh, also from, from physics, um, and we'll talk about uh, performance standard for domestic de dehumidifiers in New Zealand. Awesome. I'll uh, just share my screen quickly. Perfect. I uh, hope you can all see that. Um, yeah, so my summer project was on these little guys in the picture here. Um, domestic portable dehumidifiers in New Zealand. And yeah, it was supervised by Sam Lowry. Um, so the first thing is to look at is, well, why would we look at a performance standard for, for dehumidifiers in New Zealand? And the first thing here is that we've got 25% of homes um, use a dehumidifier in New Zealand. So it's a reasonable amount. Um, and many New Zealand homes would benefit from using one. Um, and that's where I'd like to point to this um, figure here from the pilot housing uh, survey. Um, so this was showing the amount of the extent of mold in New Zealand homes. And it was taken from a sample of 830 houses, I think, in New Zealand. Um, and you can see there's quite a large proportion of houses um, with moderate or worse um, mold extent. Um, so yeah, New Zealand has a bit of a, a dampness problem here. Um, and currently dehumidifiers are advertised with capacities tested at 30 degrees C and 80% relative humidity. And that's basically a sauna. Um, and dehumidifiers in New Zealand are often used at temperatures as low as 10 degrees C. So it makes it quite difficult for a consumer to know what they're getting when they buy a dehumidifier. Um, if it's got a capacity that's tested at something that's way different to what they're actually gonna be using it at, at in their home. So this is why it's probably important to look at introducing a performance standard here. Um, and there's also no currently no indication of energy efficiency on dehumidifiers. So consumers have no idea um, which dehumidifier might be better than the next um, in terms of energy efficiency. And again, just highlighting this dampness issue in New Zealand, we've got that almost two thirds of all building failures in New Zealand um, are accounted for by dampness issues. Um, so what might the potential benefits of uh, introducing a standard for dehumidifiers in New Zealand be? Um, so one of the main ones here is, is improvements in energy efficiency. So we've got from the IEA um, in their net zero 2050 scenario, um, they identified that improvements in energy efficiency deliver the second largest contribution to reducing CO2 emissions. Um, and that's what this figure two here is just showing, it really highlights how important um, improvements in energy efficiency are going to be if we want to reach net zero. Um, and then we've got, um, from the point of view of the consumer, there's gonna be a lot of um, utility bill savings by introducing efficiency standards. So we've got 2 trillion US dollars by 2030 um, in the US, which was um, an estimate made by that reference there. Um, and we also know from some locally done research that dehumidifiers are a product that are quite sensitive to or efficiency sensitive to improve design. So that's an important thing to consider there as well. Um, so then the way my project kind of worked was that we took 
uh, kind of audit of all the current dehumidifier standards and looked at all of them and made a bit of a comparison to get an idea of what a New Zealand standard might look like. Um, so several standards from overseas were, were compared um, and there weren't that many. Um, and we've kind of con I've condensed them down to the ones in this table. These were the ones that were focused on because a lot of them ended up being based on, for example, um, the Hong Kong uh, efficiency scheme was based on the ANSI and AHAM DH1. Um, so I kind of narrowed them down to these main, main ones here. Um, and you can see I plotted some of them on this um, psychrometric chart. So up here, we've got the US CFR, which is the Code of Federal Regulations. So down here, the green dot there. Um, and up here was the ANSI and AHAM one, 2008. Um, but we're obviously looking at temperatures down in 10 degrees C range in New Zealand and quite high relative humidities. So the current standards used in the US and overseas are nowhere near where dehumidifiers might be used at in New Zealand. Um, and these old British standards here, um, I actually looked at these and they're not um, regulated anymore. They're not part of the British regulation. So there's no, no European standard that I could find currently, which isn't very good. Um, and just a little bit about the standards themselves. Um, they generally include a method of testing for manufacturers to adhere to when making representations about their products. And then they included a minimum energy performance requirement or a graded rating system. Um, so a, a minimum efficiency that units had to meet um, in order to be sold. So what might a New Zealand standard look like? Um, we thought the important thing to look at would be airflows. So this is something that other standards didn't look at, I found. Um, and dehumidifier um, kind of performance can, be, can vary quite largely depending on the airflow. So it's probably quite important to look at. Um, and obviously we should be looking at temperatures, lower temperatures um, that are closer to what we might find in New Zealand um, when we're using dehumidifiers. Um, and we also thought tests at higher relative humidity would be, would be important as well, because currently they're all tested at 60% relative humidity. Um, so we've got the, the high performance of some product to the high relative humidity may be missed if we only test it 60%. Um, future work. So was, I found that there's lots of future work that could be done with this project. Um, there's a lot to be done. Um, how to pick the right size dehumidifier. Non, there's not um, much to be found about this. Um, so this is which capacity dehumidifier should you be trying to buy for your particular room. Um, and we also want to look at um, obviously the low temperatures and the high relative humidity tests. And we want to test at the different airflows um, and also room position. Um, it's not known, there's been no research done on where the optimum location for a dehumidifier might be in the room. And that's probably a pretty important thing to look at. And yeah, so this future work would probably highlight the, the shortcomings of technology and um, force manufacturers to improve the technology for, for colder environments. So yeah, perfect. Thanks for listening. Great, thank you, Ryan. Uh, do we have any questions for William? I know having uh, purchased a dehumidifier last year, the, the struggle of actually finding information and making decisions uh, mm. in terms of what, what the right one is was virtually impossible. Yeah. So I certainly see the relevance of this. <laughs> William, does, does the size and layout of the room make any difference? I'm just thinking that different countries have quite different um, 
house sizes and configurations of rooms as well. Yeah, so it does. Um, and it, it, I really didn't manage to find much about this. So I think it was in my future work section was to look at um, how the kind of which size dehumidifier you should be getting for, for a certain room volume. Um, I think it's probably an important thing to look at in the future. Cool. Uh, William, that was really interesting. I'm just noting that there are a lot of New Zealand houses that get colder than 10 degrees C as well, sadly. Yeah. And um, yeah. there might be a benefit to testing dehumidifiers at even lower temperatures for some houses. Yeah, definitely. I think that would that's probably a good idea. Yeah. All right, great. We'll, uh, we'll leave it there uh, and move on uh, to Pablo Paulson, uh, also from physics, exploring the seasonal variation in electric vehicle charging in New Zealand. Um, so can everyone see this? No, not yet. Oh, oh here, yeah, it's uh, coming up now. Yeah, perfect. Right, sweet. Okay. Um, so. Hi, my name is Pavel Paulson. I'm a third year student majoring in physics and statistics and minoring in computer science. Over the summer, I've done a research project on exploring the seasonal variation in electric vehicle charging in New Zealand. Uh, previous work on electric vehicle power demand within New Zealand includes yearly demand scenarios to model the expected power demand over the course of the year. Daily variations in charging patterns have also been studied However, there's a lack of studies on seasonal variations of electricity consumption. Uh, current electricity demand peaks in the winter months with approximately 600 gigawatt hours more power used per month in the winter months compared to the summer months. And this difference increases cost as generation and transmission infrastructure needs to be built to meet peak demand. So this pro project, we analyze the seasonal trend in both efficiency and electricity consumption of passenger electric vehicles and use this to look at future electricity demand if a large percentage of New Zealand, New Zealand's uh, fleet is electrified. Our primary data source used for this project was collected from onboard computers of electric vehicles around New Zealand by Flip the Fleet. This data includes the region of the vehicle, vehicle's model, monthly efficiency and distance traveled. Other data sources were used for weather and vehicle behavior analysis. Uh, from the, the fleet data, uh, monthly weighted average energy economy is calculated. Uh, a seasonal decomposition is then used to find the seasonal trend, which shows a higher energy economy slash lower efficiency in the winter relative to the summer with a peak to trough difference of around 10.7%. This means the higher energy economy coincides with the existing peak demand periods, and therefore it is an important factor to consider when preparing New Zealand's future electricity network. On this slide, Auckland is used as an example to show that energy economy, shown in black, and heating degree days, shown in red, are highly correlated. For those of you who don't know, heating degree days is a measurement of the amount of heating required. Uh, of note, there's actually a slight increase in energy economy in summer within Auckland. We saw this increase in summer months is due to AC usage. Because of this, cooling degree days was also considered in the analysis. Uh, the seasonal trend in vehicle kilometers traveled was analyzed using the Ministry of Transport's vehicle kilometers traveled data, as shown in green and the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment's fuel trade data as shown in red. Both data sets suggest a decrease in distance travel in the winter months relative to the summer months. However, there was some data, there were the issues with these data and the exact magnitude and change is unclear and is likely between one and 5%, which is a small change relative to the change in energy economy. So without more accurate data, we propose to model distance using no monthly dependency. I only consider the seasonal trend of the energy economy shown in black. Therefore, distance traveled is then based on the Ministry of Transport's 2019 
yearly regional vehicle kilometers traveled. In our final model, energy economy is a weighted linear model based on heating degree days and cooling degree days with an intercept based on region and vehicle model as shown. Calculating the coefficients for your heating degree day and cooling degree day, they were statistically highly significant. Um, lo looking at the right equation, the fleet model makeup proportions are summed as each vehicle has different energy economy as to get the average consumption of the fleet. From this, electricity consumption is simply the average energy economy of the fleet times the distance traveled. Uh, assuming a 100% electric vehicle uptake, with the Ministry of Transport's 2019 vehicle kilometers traveled and flip the fleet's average energy economy, our model estimates that New Zealand's monthly electricity consumption by electric vehicles will be around 40 gigawatt hours per month higher in July than it is in January, which is a difference of around 10%. Uh, to put this in perspective, the current electricity demand is around 600 gigawatt hours per month higher in July than it is in January. Repeating this for all regions, we can see that based on our model, most New Zealand regions have a proportionally similar electricity consumption trend. Of note, however, warmer climates such as Northland and Auckland have a smaller proportional increase in electricity consumption during the winter months compared to colder climates such as Otago and Southland. So yeah, any questions on that? Uh, if You've got time to, to go over your, your teeth. Oh, yeah. Well, in conclusion, we should consider the seasonal trend in electricity consumption by passenger electric vehicles when designing our future electricity grid. However, other factors such as the electric vehicle uptake rate and the vehicle makeup of the fleet will also have a large impact. And therefore, these should be studied and planned accordingly. Yeah, I've got a question. From what I can tell from your um, presentation, petrol use is higher in the summer, but you're saying that the electricity used for EVs is higher in the winter. Is that the conclusion I take, or am I misunderstood? Uh, oops, sorry. Um, referring to um, the slide, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so we found there's a slight increase in petrol usage during the summer months. But looking at the data from the Ministry of Transport, we didn't see a significant increase in vehicle kilometers traveled in the summer. Right. But, our, but our main result was that the, the essentially we have lower efficiency of electric vehicles during the winter. So we expect with electric vehicles to have higher or well, more electricity consumption during the winter months. Is that because they're using their heaters while they drive? Yeah. And uh, petrol vehicles can use the waste heat to heat the vehicle. And they run more efficiently in cold weather. <clears throat> yeah. okay. May I ask a question? Yes, go ahead. Um, how is the energy efficiency averaged over vehicle types? Do you know? So you're energy efficiency, your EV energy economy data, I believe came from the Ministry of Transport, is that correct? Uh, the efficiency data came from Flip the Fleet. Oh, right. So um, how do they average over different vehicle types? Um, are you, are you, when you say different vehicle types, do you mean like commercial vehicles and passenger vehicles? Oh, no, sorry, what I mean is, um, you know, vehicle makers like oh. Tesla or Nissan or whatever, you know, vehicles, uh, the economy of the vehicle is one thing that a purchaser will look for. How do they average over age and type? Um, That's maybe not your yeah. problem. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I... <laughs> In the results, I show some things on which vehicles are efficient, but I didn't really have time to show all that in this presentation. Okay. But... No, that's great. Very yeah. interesting. Thank you. Any last questions for Pablo?
All right. Well, thank you, Pablo. Uh, unfortunately, Hannah Connings uh, is unwell, so sh she's not able to, to present today um, on, on her project looking at the impact of daily variation in outdoor temperature and solar gain on future residential space heating demand under different building code scenarios. Uh, so if you're interested in that, I encourage you to, to follow up with, with her or with us and we can put you in, in touch. Um, I'm just wondering if there's any um, last minute questions across uh, for any of the, the presenters. If you have one, now's your opportunity. Uh, if not, um, I just want to thank all of our presenters. It was, uh, it was all really, really well done, uh, excellent presentations, uh, and really sort of demonstrates the value of these uh, summer scholarships for the, the energy research community. So everyone could uh, join me in a, a virtual round of applause. Uh, 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 that, that was really good. Um, so thank you everyone. And um, we will be in touch with our next uh, seminar once it's, uh, and it will be advertised once we uh, sort out the details.